And so here we go. Uh, this is Ken Long from Tortoise Capital with the review of the weekly Tortoise Strategy Report and the daily report for February 25th, 2012. Uh, starting in the usual way, um, we've got a bullish quiet market. It's at 64 out of 100 on a uh, uh, weekly RSI 14. So it's at the high end of uh, the normal range. At 70, it goes into the overbought status on uh, weekly RSI. <coughs> uh, on a 10-day MDX, we are at uh, overbought conditions with a 92 out of 100. Percent stretch relative to the 200-day moving average is 9.53%. That's bullish. It's coded uh, green, so that's very strong uh, relationship between price and the 200, so we're very strong. Five-day slip at a 50-day moving average is also uh, positive in the green. That's very strong bullish. Uh, ADX 14 has uh, gone above the uh, critical number of 35, so it's almost at 40. 39.7, so that's a very strong bullish market. ATR percentage is uh, under uh, 1%. It's now at 0.80%, so very quiet. Um, you'll recall that's about one, almost uh, one-fifth of what the ADX was, or the uh, ATR percentage was back in August and September. And so it's no coincidence that that extreme lack of volatility has uh, uh, correlated strongly to this to the gain, this uh, strong bull that we've been in. Um, volatility is inversely correlated to gains. So bull quiet, overbought on a short-term basis. The current holdings of the 26 and 13 ETF portfolios for the blended monthly rebalancing, you'll notice there. The next reevaluation for them will be on or about 1 March. Uh, in ETF2, the theoretical model is still at 100% exposed. The model portfolio is at 100% exposed. Lisa, you had a question about uh, what the, um, the current database shows on page 2. So if we were looking, uh, if we looked at the database on Friday or, you know, tonight, the three strongest in uh, the 13 ETF portfolio would be uh, Russell 2000, the small caps, then technology, and then the U.S. mid cap. So that's the risk on trade in the U.S. And now what I want you to notice is that both emerging markets and Latin America have gotten stronger than SPY and uh, U.S. real estate. U.S. real estate and U.S. large caps, you know, SPY, have been... Um, very strong in the last six months of 2011. So now the risk on trade is starting to work. So you're seeing I, you know, small caps, tech, and mid caps in the U.S. So it's still the U.S., but now it's shifting to risk on. In the 26 ETF portfolio, uh, conversely, it is uh, Brazil, Russell 2000 small caps, and uh, the financial spider. So these are all these are ranked by that STR rating. That's that blended three and six month relative strength. So if we were going if we were going to rebalance today, those would be the ones that we own. Um, the ones I show on page one are the ones as of uh, the beginning of the month. Lisa, does that answer your question? I will presume that it does. Yep. Okay. Good. I like to look at the bottom feeders too. Um, it's all the it's uh, Treasuries, Japan, uh, Australia. Notice how far down diamonds have come. Diamonds were also the big leader last year in the U.S., so they're starting to drift. Uh, in the 26 portfolio, it's uh, agriculture, Swiss franc, short and long-term Treasuries, gold. <clears throat> so it's risk on everywhere you look. All right, next up is the uh, market health check. 
and pull it down just a little bit more. So again, our uh, vertical blue lines represent 10, 20, and 30 days of look back. And the horizontal purple line still is at 137. That's the swing high. Uh, we're pushing that number right now. Uh, we're right at that swing high from last year. Um, Friday ended in a little doji there, so maybe that's a test of 137. No significant indication of sell-off. No panic selling in here, even though last week was pretty much flat. The horizontal red lines represent uh, previous support levels where the market has held on pullbacks. Uh, so right now, the first pullback that we would see is right at the 50-day moving average. That would be a 5% pullback from the swing high. That would take it to 130. Now, that would feel like a really horrible move, given how little uh, volatility there uh, there is. If we look at uh, ATR percentage right now is 0.8%, a move from 137 to 130, that would be six ATRs. Although, um, in a bull market, pullbacks of up to 5% would be considered normally noise. Uh, a 6 ATR adverse move would sure feel abnormal right now. Uh, the black line in the center is the regression line of the, thir of the last 30 days minus, uh, with one day offset. So we're looking at day minus 1 to minus 30. The outer black lines are the channel formed by the maximum excursion from the regression line that looked like it happened here seven, uh, about 17 January and then again here uh, uh, at the end of January. So we have price is uh, right on the regression line, right where you would expect to find it. And it's better than the 10-day moving average and it's better than the 50-day moving average and it's better than the 200-day moving average, which is this boundary uh, with the blue shaded area. Uh, so this is the very definition of a bull market. We have uh, 80x up here uh, pushing 40 with the bulls clearly in charge. Uh, we are back into overbought condition here on Williams percent R, as you can see. And we can stay overbought for a long time. Each of these previous dips has been a buy on dip opportunity. Uh, but we'll see how it reacts when it gets through 137. The uh, PPO, the percent price oscillator, is like the MACD histogram, but it uses percent rather than dollars. And the, uh, the 10 and the 20 day period have been so close to each other, there's, it's hard to fit a knife blade in between their values. Uh, so it's basically not telling us much right now. Um, the slope of the regression line uh, of the last 30 days uh, is still basically uh, where it has been constantly about this 0.26. Um, that's very favorable. That's what a, a 0.26 steady state slope line here um, is sort of what uh, a good bull market looks like. So what I see is, is test in 137, a breakout from above 137 will just go because there's no resistance overhead for the last year. Uh, sell off. The first sell off I would see tests 134, the bottom of the regression line, uh, and then to the 50 day at 130, and then about 125, which is the uh, 200 day moving average. Actually, to be precise, 124.99. So I see the channel here is 130 to 137, and we're knocking on the door. All very favorable. Okay, moving on. Next up is a review of the ETF2 database. Uh, we have all 10 of the regional ETFs on a buy signal. That keeps us at 100% invested, 0% cash, same as last week. And again, just like last week, we're in bull quiet. Um, the US SPY is better than the rest of the world, EFA. In other words, 69 is better than 63. 
Among the U.S. indexes, the strongest is uh, the, the technology at 73, um, then small caps, then uh, mid caps, followed by uh, the large caps. The two strongest sectors, technology and small caps, two weakest are Japan and Asia less Japan. Next up, the world market model. Starting inside the U.S., it's the small caps again. Uh, value and blend are extremely strong. Brazil is extremely strong. Uh, the rest of the U.S. is all above average in the white here. Um, you can see over in Europe, Sweden and Germany are exceptionally strong. A bunch are above average, yet Belgium and Spain only are lagging have um, uh, the usual winners in Asia, less Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, China, and India have been lagging for the last year, and they continue to lag. Uh, all of the other asset classes are, are lagging. Silver looks stronger than gold right now, though. Um, in the business sectors, um, it's the risk on trade. You can see finance, energy, materials, industrials, and technology, this upper half, all strong. The defensive sectors are all weak, led by utilities. All the currencies are lagging behind the equities, as, as you would expect in a bull. So it's still the U.S., it's still risk on uh, strength in Brazil and uh, Latin America. This is of interest for us. <coughs> Uh, next up, the ETF2 database, the top 30, based on the average score. What I want you to notice on this one is that there's a number of, uh, of these things that are winners, but which have now turned red on the strength. And that's a, uh, remember, the strength is the first thing that, that changes among these three subordinate categories, strength, consistency, and quality. The one that turns first is the strength column. The average is the blend of those three. So the strength is the most volatile, followed by consistency, followed by quality. So what this says is these ones that are, that are in the green on the average, but which are turning red in strength, those are, are really, uh, that's really points out that they're turning around quickly. Uh, so you'll see that that's the uh, municipal bonds, and more municipal bonds, and uh, more municipal bonds. And so this is really telling you this is a flight of money from bonds over into equities. The things that are starting to work are these ones down in here where you can see the last thing to change is quality in the yellow, followed by the consistency in the white, and then the green uh, in the strength column. So the things to be really interested in, growth, technology, Russell 2000, materials uh, index, um, also small cap growth. That's where the that's where the strength is turning. Now these ones up here that are green across the board are still good to be in. Regional banking, biotech, U.S. home construction, um, again U.S. tech once more. Uh, so those are all looking solid. Moving on. Uh, taking a look now at the Dow 30 using the same strategy, except now I'm always interested in basically the strength column. And so the, the strongest five companies based on that three and six month relative strength, Bank of America, Caterpillar, Home Depot, GE, and Microsoft, uh, the five weakest, Johnson & Johnson, Coke, Hewlett Packard, Walmart, and Alcoa. Now it's interesting to note that Alcoa had been the weakest previously, you know, almost for the last two to three months and it has started to move off the bottom. Now it's in the, in the 25th position instead of uh, lagging behind the pack um, a great distance. And with price at 1043, it's still a good buy uh, in my view. ATR is 25 cents. So still quite a bit of room for it to go. I like the fact that it trades 27 million shares a day. 
So that gives us our relative strength winners and losers in the Dow. Looking at the liquidity, um, let's go through that one. Uh, here's a new chart I've added. I've been tracking this for about a year, and uh, it's uh, important enough to share. So I will keep this in the um, in the weekly. This is a uh, market volatility study, okay, and it is a uh, time series of SPY's 30-day standard deviation over the last five years expressed as a percentage of price. So it's, um, it's a measure of uh, volatility. It has a slightly longer look back period than the ATR percentage. Um, the chart on the left is like the last 180 days. So it's a zoom in on um, really uh, this right hand, right hand chart. The right hand side looks at five years back. So that's like uh, 1300 trading days. And what I want you to notice is that most of the time, the standard deviation is less than 1%. Okay. And uh, so and it, when it gets below 0.5%, uh, uh, you could have, that's one way of considering that to be a very quiet market. Well, that's where we are right now. The uh, thick blue line is the actual time series each day of the, um, of the standard deviation. And then the black line is a 10 period moving average. Now, one of the things I'd, I'd like you to notice is that uh, the market goes from these periods of very quiet and sideways behaviors, which is very good for gains. And then you get these extraordinary system shocks. Uh, that's what the August um, spike looked like. It's about 100 and if we went back about 120 days, this, this peak right up here, about 2.5% right there, which corresponds up around in here, that peak. Uh, that was the peak in August. And we've had nothing but the market go up since then and volatility uh, start leaving the market. So we are at a peak, well, actually not a peak, a, a bottom of the channel in terms of volatility. So we've been in bull quiet uh, for an extended period of time now, like 30 days. Um, what happens, it stays that way until it no longer stays that way. So I get very interested in the VIX as a trading device when we're uh, down in territory like this. And so I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation today uh, another VIX trade from last Friday. Um, so it almost looks like, if taken from a distance, this looks like heartbeats to me. And so we're right at this. Uh, one thing we notice when the volatility spike comes in and it gets up to the peak and crosses its own 10-day average after an extreme move up, that's an interesting time to start looking to sell volatility. In other words, being on the other side of the VIX trade, being short the VIX. This is a time to start thinking about being long the VIX. I take it basically as a daily intraday trade. I'm not holding it overnight because it's extremely volatile. But that's that's where the interesting trade is right now to me. All right, moving on. I think that's it for the uh, weekend report. I'm going to shift over to the daily now. <clears throat> Okay, next up is the daily. All right, I'm not going to uh, revisit the, uh, the top band, so we'll just get right into the second set. Um, looking at the gap stat, right now the gap down reversal in the last 30 days has happened uh, 13 out of 14 times. So. You have a gap down drop has happened one time out of 30. The gap down reverse and then reverse to close higher has happened 13 times. So in the last 30 days, the way we read this, 14 times the market has gapped down. 
13 out of the 14 times it has reversed to close higher. Now, that's not surprising in retrospect when you look back in a bull market. Um, you would expect it to keep going up. Uh, but th what this says is that the uh, morning gap, the morning hook is still uh, favored. The, <clears throat> the gap up has happened 16 times, and it's an even split between going on to close higher or reversing to close lower than the open. So there's no edge in either direction on that one. But the gap down has been uh, clearly favoring the morning hook and then playing for the reversal. Um, you can see on the 10-day NDX time series, we are still oversold. I mean, correction, overbought. Pardon me. No signals in overreaction or in channeling. You can see the pivot points. Uh, there's only 80 cents or 86 cents between the pivot and R3 and the pivot and uh, S3. That's a function of how um, narrow the range was on Friday. You can see the volatility that has just dropped right out of this market. It got even lower now. It's at 0.8 percent using uh, ATR percentage. Um, ADX pushing uh, that upper limit at 40. Hard for it to stay that high. Ten day min pain for the Dow 30. These are the ones that have the least losses from their ten day high. So these are the strength winners in, in that sense. Exxon Mobil, American Express, Chevron, 3M, and Procter and Gamble from the ETF 100 been oil and short term bonds. Uh, ten day max pain, which is where I like to hang out among the Dow 30. These are the ones that have lost the most on a percent basis from their ten day high. Hewlett Packard, Walmart, Bank of America, Intel, and Kraft. Uh, among the ETFs, it's the VIX, natural gas, uh, transports, don't know what that is, and uh, semis. Um, looking at pattern setups for the short term swing trade setups, we have a triple screen in U.S. real estate. <clears throat> uh, in the auto framer, Minimum two to one reward to risk ratio. If we uh, if we just bought the um, five cents above Friday's high with a stop five cents below Friday's low, and then got a retracement to the ten day uh, to the ten day high, we'd have four symbols that uh, have a better than two to one reward to risk ratio: VIX, Hewlett Packard, Walmart, Natural Gas. So I'll be certainly looking at those first three. Moving on, uh, the Dow 30 tactical summary. You see we got a handful of dojis. Uh, what I like is uh, Hewlett Packard and Walmart. Uh, you can see this is the numbers from the auto framer. You can see uh, Hewlett Packard is the number one uh, max pain range. I mean Hewlett Packard, I'm just going to be all over that like a fat kid on cake. I mean, what we have is it's a max pain. It's a max pain range compression. It's the number one max pain range compression. Uh, it has a 4.6 4 to 1 auto framer reward to risk. Uh, the red uh, shading here indicates that it was a percent loser on Friday compared to the rest of the Dow. It's got a frog quality number of three, so it's highlighted. It's got a 20 cent standard deviation over its 30 day range, so I'm looking to manage about a 20 cent stop on it. Um, and it can move typically 80 cents intraday from low to high or high to low. Um, the reason it's a max pain, it's it uh, in the 10 days, it's lost seven percent. So all these three, four at the top are coded red. So they have lost an exceptional amount compared to the rest of the Dow from where the, from where price was 10 days ago. You can see things like uh, Exxon Mobil and Microsoft. They've gained 4.2 and 3.9 respectively. Um, but Hewlett Packard and uh, Walmart are in pain. Now, Walmart's interesting too. It's a channeling trade, so it's better than this 200-day moving average, but it's pulled back to oversold on uh, 
It's a 10-day NDX. It's a max pain. It's number two in terms of max pain range compression, and it's got a 6.5 to 1 reward to risk ratio compared to its 10-day high. So that's, that's going to be on my uh, short list and so on. So that's two pretty good ideas to look at. Looking at the uh, tactical summary for the ETS. <clears throat> Next up we have, um, so there's two uh, that meet the auto framer reward to risk ratio. The VIX has a 2.7 to 1 and uh, natural gas is 2.3 to 1. We have a triple screen and a doji set up here in U.S. real estate, which is has a frog quality number of three. So there's a lot of good reasons to be interested in U.S. real estate. Uh, oil has gone from hated to beloved with a price now above 42. And you can see the uh, gain, it's had outsized gains compared to its peers, um, really from one day all the way out to six months. Uh, silver is of interest to me. It's uh, 3437. Um, still looking pretty good in my view. Very still tradable. Moving on. Looking at the market mosaic next, you can see the uh, regression line, R squared is still up about 0.92. Very little, dis uh, very little distance between the regression line and its 10-day moving average. It's now under uh, one standard deviation above the norm. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's hard for it to get much steeper than this unless people keep buying. But you can see the corresponding gains when we look at percent relative to the 200-day moving average. Uh, it's had quite a move. We're almost at two full standard deviations above. This has uh, uh, been an incredible run, basically, is what we're seeing here. That's been almost a four standard deviation move off the August lows. What's this tell me? Just caution at 137 and a pullback to 130 would be absolutely still within normal. And that would be like about 5%. That would take us down to just above average, right where the red dot is. That's how far it can fall under normal conditions and still be classified as noise. That will feel like a shock if that happens next week just because it's so volatile. Uh, that would be such a volatile move, and the market has been quiet for so long. Uh, just quickly go through the, I'm not going to read the charts to you, signal to noise and, and whatnot. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, system quality numbers in here. So we're taking a look at the Dow 30 for right now. I've got it sorted by... Um, system quality number from two months ago and I like to start among the red I like to find things that were red and are now getting much better so um, you can see IBM has gone from 0.08 to 2.93 and that's a positive deviation of 2.84 system quality number points that's exceptional that's the second best in the market except for Caterpillar which is 3.28 so it's back up above 115 now uh, you know you can remember not too long ago, Caterpillar was down around 80, and it was horrible. And now, boom, all the way back up at the top. Once the market shifted to risk on, and then the basic business sector started kicking in, Caterpillar um, does well in that kind of environment. Uh, so IBM, um, Hewlett Packard is not bad. Alcoa, DuPont is not bad, going from 0.96 to 2.71. So basically what I look for are these things that are in the green, in this divergence column, the first column, um, I like I like bottom feeding down here because you had something that was horrible two months ago, and is now getting better. So I'm interested in Hewlett Packard because it has been slowly healing, but because the system quality number of, th of the last month is still in the yellow, it still has room to go to catch up to its peers. So I, I like it for that reason. The one that's interesting here, is if you want to find something long and strong, it's Home Depot. Uh, on the last year, three months ago, two months ago, this month, it just continues to dominate its peers. Uh, still very powerful. 
but you can see just how many things that were strong two months ago are now lagging way behind in the last 30 days. And so there is sort of this oscillating nature between things that are horrible two months ago and now get better, and things that were are horrible back here and then have quickly gotten better, and things that were great two months ago that have now sold off, like Pfizer and Merck. So that's why I like to look for things that were horrible two months ago and are starting to get better. Um, what that tells me also is that Pfizer and Merck, at the end of their little negative run here, uh, uh, could be candidates for getting better. So again, that's consistent with my belief that from extreme conditions come extreme moves. Um, looking at the ETF 30, the same logic. Uh, silver and gold, very positive deviations over here. And uh, even Japan, for that matter. U.S. technology and uh, has been really dominant. Uh, but for me, silver and gold are of interest because they were horrible two months ago and are now getting much, much better. All right. Now I want to just take a quick look at uh, the VIX trade from last week. Let me pull that real quick for you. I didn't have this preloaded. Uh, this will be another one of those sideways quiet channels. And it was very reminiscent of the uh, last Friday of the workshop. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can zoom it up a little bit. Okay. So uh, it was last Friday. Um, there was a moment in time. Um, this was really by the exit. The VIX had gone from negative. It had gone from underwater uh, negative for the, for the day uh, to be almost a 4% gain to the positive by the time we get up here around 25. So it went from about 2360 uh, down in this area in the middle of the sideways quiet channel all the way up to over 25. So uh, quite a move. Um, so this was the break in the day. That's what it opened down here at the low of the day. Um, you see that the purple dots and the purple line is the VWAP, the uh, volume weighted average price. The uh, Bollinger Band is plus or minus one. The mean is the thick red line. The thick blue line is the uh, 10 period regression line. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you that don't have regression lines on your charting packages, if you use a three period exponential moving average, it comes fairly close. Uh, the only one I haven't been able to match with a uh, with a moving average is this 30 period regression line. That's the solid black line. Uh, I have not found a moving average yet that, that mirrors that one very well. I'm still searching. So we're looking at uh, three minute charts and uh, really just one day's worth of data. And all I want to show on this is that there, at the, in the lunchtime, in central time, from about 11 in the morning uh, to just about uh, 1300, so about a two hour period, what we had was uh, everything inside the Bollinger Band here. You got price, you have 10 uh, regression line, 10 regression line, 30. The Bollinger Band mean, of course, has to be in there in price. Um, it showed some signs. It had a crossover here at about noon where the 10 crossed the 30. 
and there was a little tradable move inside here, but it came back to the mean and then broke out of what I classify as this sideways quiet channel. What you have is an extended period where the mean is flat and the Bollinger Bands have pinched to a narrow rate and then a breakout from there. Whether you bought this one or you buy this one with a stop below uh, the swing low, uh, you get a really favorable uh, move here. So you end up getting an entry right about 23.80 or 23.90 depending on where your fill was. And where I have that red dot is the uh, regression line crossover where blue now crosses black outside of the Bollinger Band and just starts taking off. So with about a 20 or 30 cent stop here, you end up getting a move of about 23.90 um, to 25. So that's about a dollar 10 or dollar 20. That's anywhere from a three to a four hour move, depending on how wide your initial stop was. You may have gotten out here uh, where price started to flatten off, and then you may or may not have re-entered. So, but even on this first surge, this first explosion out of the uh, Bollinger Band channel when the regression lines cross over, there's a two hour trade uh, in about 40 minutes. Uh, and then you can use markets money if you want to re-enter or leave a piece on. And so we're looking at about anywhere from three to four hour trade. Uh, my exit is not later than where that blue line crosses back into the uh, Bollinger Band region. What I want you to notice is that you get this congestion zone in here. Uh, you have the regression lines and the VWAP all tightly compressed right inside that Bollinger Band. And then when it starts to break out, the first thing that happens is price leaves, followed quickly by the three period movement average or the regression line 10. And that's when you got to, you have to be buying that uh, if you want to get those kinds of moves. Um, and then the uh, 30 period regression line stays out. Now what I want you to notice is that 30 period regression line is very smooth. Um, and it only gets flat when this uh, when the 10 period crosses back over here and starts to dip back in, it's still just going flat. Uh, so as long to me, I, I guess what I'm considering right now as a definition of a trending market is when the blue and the black line, the 10 and the 30 period regression line, leave the Bollinger Band. See, all in this area in here where I've shown in uh, in yellow, um, they are for the most one or both of them is inside the. Uh, Bollinger Band for most of that period of time. So that's a non-trending market or trending sideways when the regression lines are in agreement with that Bollinger Band. When it when the truth changes right about here, you'll notice that that's when the Bollinger Bands, uh, they start to get a little wider, but the regression lines leave in a quick, quick, fast, and in a hurry. So when both of those are outside and leaving the trains leaving the station, I'm, I'm defining that as the beginning of a trending period. And it stays that way until one or both of them come back into, uh, into the Bollinger Band. So this is a hint right here that the trending behavior has weakened. Um, and that's a, a reason to stay long here is that the, even though the Bollinger Band got flat, or I mean the uh, regression line got flat and price was hesitating, it never even got back inside the blue. So uh, that looks to me like a, a working definition of trending behavior. And that is the regression lines are outside the Bollinger Band channel. And then uh, this is where it starts to get weak, and that's a reason to, uh, to cover or to cash that position. Uh, Pete asked me, what charting tool am I using that shows linear regression lines? Uh, uh, I'm using um, Scott Trade Elite. Um, it will also show it in, you can get it to show in uh, TradeStation as well. Uh, for the 10 period, again, you can use that three, um, three period exponential moving average to give you an approximation of the blue line, but I have not found a good uh, moving average proxy yet for the regression line. It just, uh, it's, it's smooth, but when it adapts, it changes pretty quickly. It changes much faster um, than a moving average does. So I'm, if, I'm still on the hunt for that. Um, the other side of this though is what I'd like you to, is, what I'd like you to know this is that the um, there's a fairly strong correlation between this, uh, you know, uh, the MACD histogram using a uh, 10, 20, 
and 8 setting. Uh, you, if you'll notice down here during the sideways quiet channel, the, uh, the MACD histogram never really uh, gets very wide in either direction. And then, and then right here at, at this breakout, that corresponds with the regression line crossover. So you can plot the Bollinger Bands. Now, when, if you just use when the three-period moving average leaves the Bollinger Band, that would alert you that something's going on. And you can see now the MACD histogram jaws open up. They close right about where the regression lines close. And then they cross over one more time here, which is just about where the 10 and 30 regression line cross over here. So uh, in my view, there's a... Uh, there's an awful lot to be said for, uh, you could just use, I think, maybe the MACD histogram if you can't get the regression lines, because it looks to me like the crossover points on these big moves, um, are they're, they're pretty much symmetric. Okay. So uh, that's everything I wanted to say uh, tonight on the, on the charts of interest. Um, I'll be looking at Hewlett-Packard and Walmart and uh, uh, the VIX again. Uh, I wanted to show actually if I can if you can bear with me one one more minute I did want to show I think I have one on the VIX looking at hourlies it's pretty interesting too. Let me see if I can find that. As you know, I, I'm pretty fond of the time frame these days. For uh, I've been looking at the, you know, four weeks and hourly. Let's see if I can find that one on the, on the VIX, which was pretty interesting. And this is it's on hourly charts. Looking at uh, VXX. And uh, where we are right now, this was, at, this was Friday's move. And uh, this was basically the moment when, uh, when the crossover occurred, even on the, on the hourly chart, right around 24, 2390. Um, that's also where the 10 the period regression line across the 30 period regression line on hourly charts. So that's kind of a, an interesting location. You can see it also just crossed above the VWAP. And so uh, I was setting a target at that time at around 25, 25 and a half, which would have been back to the, <clears throat> the Bollinger Band mean on the hourlies. And so this is a pretty interesting price level if we look back the last time the VIX sold off when it got very, very quiet. It was down here around 2380, surprise, and had moves up to 28. This was the last day of the uh, in the um, uh, live trading workshop in Kansas City, and that that was like an 11 or 12 R. Yeah, at least I'll send you the 331. Uh, the uh, system definition has a a summary of its performance, um, but I can send you some more. So the uh, this little this uh, vigorous channel here in the in the VIX has gone from about 24 to 28, and that's a 20 20 percent channel. And the reason I'm really interested in it right now is because it's making a crossover right at a point where it made a crossover the last time to be of interest, and so. Uh, with the market exceptionally quiet and testing that 137, right now to me the VIX is a very interesting intraday trade. I am quick to reward um, any signs of success in the VIX. When it, if it gaps down and then crosses its own VWAP, that's a pretty interesting uh, location, trade location to me. So uh, sometimes it behooves us to take a look at slightly longer term time frames. Okay, so that's everything I have uh, for tonight. I'm gonna, I'll stick around for a few minutes. I'm going to stop the recording.